The sermon text this morning is Judges 13. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. There was a certain man of Zorah, of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore be careful and drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, A man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God, very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come again to us and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life, and what is his mission? And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink or any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, If you detain me, I will not eat of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name, so that when your words come true, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord, to the one who works wonders. And Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces to the ground. The angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, If the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering in our hands, or shown us all these things, or now announced to us such things as these. And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Mahanad Dan between Zorah and Eshtol. Well, we've finally come to Samson. I know that um, you've been waiting a long time. You know, the funny thing about Samson is Samson's probably the most well-known of the judges and probably the least understood of them. But what do you think of when you think of Samson? Do you think of womanizer, oversexed, has an anger management issue, uh, doesn't live up to his potential in life. It's amazing what evangelical scholars, how they speak about him. They actually speak about him with a measure of disdain. Uh, one man said this, he says, this man is extraordinarily strong and is extraordinarily stupid. Another one, this man whose birth had promised so much is a disappointment. Another scholar said that he is an embarrassment to evangelicals. You know, when you look at Sunday school lessons and they speak about the person of Samson, it's usually what, you know, what not to do and who not to be. And when you look at Samson's life in chapters, particularly 14 through 16, 
it seems as if he's a total failure. And at the end, he succeeds kind of. But even that is perceived by some as a suicide. So, so what do we do with him? You know, we've seen in all these judges that they are honorable men. They are representatives of God. They're, they're, as a society is spiraling into sin, they are there proclaiming the word of God. They're delivering Israel. They are maintaining peace until they die. We even saw Gideon and Jephthah, how they were rightly placed in Hebrews chapter 11 in this hall of faith, and men of faith. So what do we do with Samson? Is he, a, is he a hero or is he a zero? Well, you're going to have to wait a week uh, because we only have his birth narrative today. But I just wanted to tease you a little bit. Uh, this chapter is all about the birth of Samson. Now, this is significant. There are only seven birth narratives in the entire Bible. So we want to look at this. This is a detailed address of how he was born. And the reason, you know, you wouldn't expect this if you've been with us week after week. It's always they did evil in the sight of the Lord. God brought them under oppression. They cry out and then God brings deliverance. We don't see that here. We hear that they're under oppression and he talks about the birth of Samson. So why does he do it? Well, Samson's radically unique. He's radically unique. He's, all the other judges were alive and available when God chose them. But God brought forth Samson. I mean, it was a miraculous birth. He brought forth Samson to save. He's the last judge. He's the climactic judge. And think about this. 20% of the entire book is on Samson. Uh, Samson, one author said, it's almost as if God made him from scratch to save the people. Really, the passage itself, if you were to kind of summarize chapter 13, you could say it this way. You could say, God saves sinners through a spirit-filled Savior. God saves sinners through a spirit-filled Savior. That's God's intention. It sounds like a Christmas story to me. It sounds a little bit like what we talk about on December. God saves sinners through a spirit-filled Savior. So that's kind of the direction that we're going with Samson. Now, first, though, God saves sinners. Look with me back at, at verse 1. In verse 1, he says, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Now, we've been through this. This is the sixth time we read that they did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And we learned what evil was over and over, which is a forgetting God. We move along in life and we forget about God being kind of the center of our world. We forget about him and then ultimately we forsake him. We forsake him for the shiny, for the shiny trinkets of this world. And we just move on and pursue other gods. It may be success, it may be beauty, it may be position, whatever. But that becomes what we dedicate our lives to instead of God. And we shouldn't be surprised when God gave them over to the Philistines. We've seen that over and over again. And he did. The Philistines for 40 years. Now, the Philistines, you know, we even have the expression, don't be a Philistine. We often see them as very uncultured, and archaeology would, would argue otherwise. The Philistines, in fact, were advanced in their architecture. I think they're the first people to actually develop multi-story buildings. Uh, they were advanced in their military strategy. They were the first to move in battle formations in war. Uh, they were the first to use iron as weaponry. And in a bronze world, that's a game changer. But they were a brutal people. And they oppressed Israel for, for 40 years. This is the longest oppression Israel has been in in this period of the judges. But the real, the real issue here is what you don't see. It's a low point. It's the lowest point for the people of Israel. The reason I say that is because they don't even cry out. Every other time they're oppressed, they cry out. They repent. They ask God for help. Whatever their motivation, but not so here. It's as if they become so accustomed to the nature of sin and becoming slaves that they don't even call out to God. And this is, this is where sin has become normal for them. They've accustomed themselves to servitude. So this is where we see Israel now, at a low point, not even crying out to God. They're just, it's like water to the fish. They don't even understand it anymore. Uh, so I said, God saves sinners, sinners like these. Now, 
uh, you know, people have often said, well, Tom, sometimes you might talk about sin a little bit. And uh, that may be true. It may be true. Uh, I probably do it because I am a sinner, just right up front. And you might be as well. And, uh, and God actually says a lot about it. And I think we've gotten confused on the whole nature of sin. David Wells, in his book, Courage to be Protestant, says that at a survey taken, only 17% of the group surveyed would see sin as in relationship against God. In other words, sin, when you remove God from a culture, that moral center is gone, and sin becomes a word that's not even used anymore. We've replaced it with evil. Things are now evil, but evil without any moral referent can just be badness. Everybody gets to decide what evil or sin is. But, but he doesn't allow us that in the text. It says they did evil in the sight of God. Now, I don't think they saw their actions as evil. I think they probably saw themselves as morally acceptable to God. You know, later on in chapter 17, we're going to see that everyone did uh, what was right in their own eyes. It feels right to us. Proverbs says the same thing in chapter 30. There are those who are clean in their own eyes, but are not washed of their filth. There is a capacity that we have as people uh, that we just feel like our decisions and choices, they make sense to us. They're right. They're appropriate. We can justify. We can rationalize. Maybe the lies we tell, <clears throat> maybe the fabrications we make, the exaggerations, maybe the things that we take, it's coming to us. We deserve it. We were shorted before you got to do this to get along. you got to do this to climb the ladder. You take a couple extra look. It's no problem. It's consensual. I, I mean, we can justify what we do. It feels right in our own eyes. And that's what he's speaking about here. He's speaking about this issue. And even within Christian circles. Uh, we usually clothe it with different language. We say something like, well, I'm following my conscience or I'm following my heart. But you know, the scriptures never encourage us to do that. The, the scriptures encourage us to have scriptures direct our heart and scriptures are to direct our conscience and then we're mindful of them. But nobody has a heart here or a conscience that's clean enough and pure enough and, and kind of... God influenced enough to just follow it without thought. In fact, Tim Keller, when preaching on this text, he says, uh, this teaches us that sin is not ultimately consist of violating our conscience or violating our standards, but in violating God's standards. That's the nature of sin. That's what we talk about, to keep reminding ourselves because we are, such, we are so good at justifying and rationalizing. And, and so we see in this people here kind of a picture of ourselves that we forget that sin is against God. We also forget the, rep, the uh, repetitious nature of sin. In fact, the intensifying. Uh, throughout the book of Judges, they keep doing evil in the sight of the Lord, but it keeps spiraling downward. It's just not repeated, but it's intensified. And, and we do experience this. You, you may be walking with God for a season of time. You get tempted. You fall into sin. You begin to practice the sin. You get a little hardened to it. And then all of a sudden you bear the fruit of the sin and you begin to cry out to God and ask for grace. And then you may repent and rejoice in his mercy. Time goes along and you forget about it. You move back into it. And we do these cycles. There almost seems to be a, like an inescapable nature of sin that we can't seem to get out of it. It, it almost reminds us we, we need help. We cannot self-reform. We do the same things, not just in our own life, but generation after generation after generation, culture after culture after culture. Same sense. There's nothing really new about the nature of sin. We didn't develop a new type of sin in this last 50 years. But not just the repetitive nature of it, but even the deceptive nature of it. You, know, you see how they keep deceiving themselves. The nature of sin... You know, we see it kind of pictured here in this idolatry that we forget about God and then we forsake and we pursue other gods. We all struggle with this. You see things in life, they're very good things. As Philip was even praying, it can be a family, it can be a relationship, it can be a job, it can be beauty, it can be, it can be financial security. Uh, but we begin to value it so much that we begin to give ourselves to it. We actually begin to serve it. This is the nature of idolatry. It's not worshiping statues. 
it may look like that, but remember I said, even those statues represent something you need. That's what drives us as people. We will worship something. We will give ourselves to something. It may just be our own success, but we give ourselves to something, but they never satisfy. That's the problem with idolatry, is when you, a creation in the image of God, worship something else in creation, it cannot satisfy you. Even Chris Everett, many of you know the name. She was a successful woman's tennis player years back, but quite successful. She spoke to this interview. She said, I, I had no idea who I was or what I could be away from tennis. I was depressed and afraid because so much of my life had been defined by my being a tennis champion. I was completely lost. Winning made me feel like I was somebody. It made me feel pretty. It was like being hooked on a drug. I needed the wins, the applause, in order to have an identity. This is what happens to us. Our identity is wrapped up in our work. It's wrapped up in our relationship. This is the deceptive nature of sin. Now, the good news of the scriptures is the Bible is all about God saving sinners, God saving people who have chased after other gods. It's incredible how kind God is to want to restore us from our sin, to bring forgiveness and reconciliation to us. It's not just a message of the Old Testament, it's a message of the New Testament. I mean, God has always been pursuing people. And when Adam and Eve sinned against God, he went after them. They didn't come to him. God's always pursuing us to draw us back to himself. He knows that only he can satisfy us. We have been, it's like a child taken away from its parents at birth. There's always a void in that child wanting to know who my parent was. It's the same with us when we don't pursue God. He's always pursuing us. We see this in in 1 Timothy, right, Jer Jeremy read this. He says, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. So Paul's saying, I'm kind of a poster boy for someone that really needed the grace of God. And if he saves me, he can save you. So I really ask you, if you're here and you're not a Christian, or if you've fallen so far that you wonder where you are with God, God loves to save people who are broken, who have pursued everything but God in their life. I, I, I ask you, don't neglect the mercy of God that he offers. If you have in your mind, I want to wash myself up like we do when we go out. We're going to clean ourselves up, present ourselves nicely before our company. It's not the way it works with God. The only thing we bring is our sin. But it's good because he saves sinners. But for the Christian here, I would say this, that, that we still struggle with sin. I mean, the nature of redemption, when God gives new birth to a Christian, he takes out the heart of the stone, he puts in a heart of flesh that responds to the gospel. We still struggle with sin. John Owen, a great um, theologian of the 17th century, he spoke about that the cross of Christ broke the dominion of sin. We're not bound to sin anymore, but we still struggle with the presence of sin. All of us do. It's a very superficial and a very immaturish understanding to think you don't struggle with sin once you become a Christian. And we see that even in the people of Israel. That's who we're to identify with, the people of Israel. But, but for the Christian here, would you repent? Do you practice repentance? I mean, not just to God, but to one another. When you do sin against them, do you make that right? Paul says, so I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Do you strive to keep your conscience clear? You know, we, we do want to confess our, the nature of our sin. Now, now many of us, again, we, we feel hesitant to confess or to come to God because we feel like he won't accept us because we have intentionally sinned again. You know, those dark corners of our life that we don't tell any about, maybe turning to alcohol just for relief. It may be food. It may be pornography. It may be relationships that are unhealthy, that, that we, we, we got to get those cleaned up before we come back to God. But that isn't the way God shows himself in Scripture. He shows himself as merciful. To the Christian, we can go to him confessing to him our sin. In fact, Owen gives us words on this. He says, 
He writes that the high priest can deal, that is, Jesus Christ, can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward. This means that he can no more cast off poor sinners for their ignorance and wandering than a nursing father should cast away a sucking child for its crying. And thus thus it is with Christ. He is able with all meekness and gentleness, with patience and moderation, to bear with the infirmities, the sins, the provocations of his people, even as a nurse or a nursing father bears with the weakness of a poor infant. This is no license to sin if you understand the cross. It is simply an invitation to us, to the Christian, to go to him and to take your sin. Those deep deep pockets, those dark corners of your life, God saves sinners. That's what we're learning here. Now, the question is, well, how is God saving sinners? Well, we see this, of course, as the angel appears to Manoah and his wife. This is how he's going to do it. God's going to save sinners through really surprising ways. Look with me back at 2 to 5. Verses 2 to 5, he says, There was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of the Danites whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. The angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink or eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So here you see the grace of God again. He's pursuing sinners. He wants to save sinners. He's pursuing sinners. No, they were unrepentant. They weren't crying out. They weren't asking for help. God moves anyways because he's that gracious. But notice the uniqueness of his grace. He, appeal, he appears to this woman. She doesn't even get a name. She's nameless and childless. And he tells her, no, you're going to have a son. And your son will save Israel. That you'll conceive, you'll have a son, and he'll save it. And you're to, to drink no strong wine that you're to eat nothing unclean, which implies that she was already pregnant. And the son that you'll have, no razor will come upon his head. And what's this mean? Well, this is, this is probably referring to Numbers chapter 6. It's called the Nazarite vow. For people who were outside the priestly role, it was a way that the non-priest tribe could dedicate themselves to God. They wouldn't drink anything of the vine. They wouldn't touch a dead body. They wouldn't cut their hair. It was kind of showing they understand they're on a pilgrimage, uh, that they are dedicating their lives. But it was a temporary vow. Nobody can live that way forever. But, but for this young boy, he will. From the womb up, he'll live that way. That's the angel said. So that's the experience the woman has. And so then the woman runs to her husband and says, Hey, unbelievable news. Though I was barren, I shall conceive. And, and the angel told me we're going to have a son, and the son's going to be a judge. He's going to save Israel. Well, naturally, he's probably looking for a degree of confirmation, wondering about had, what had she been into, who had she talked to. And, and so then he asks, he prays. He says, God, I want to hear it. it. It seems like it was an honorable request. It was a big deal because the angel of the Lord did appear to him. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to him, he begins to question this angel. Look with me at 12. In 12, he says, and Manoah said, now, when your words come true... So there's faith there. What is it to be? What is to be the child's manner of life? And what is his mission? And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. Interesting, he doesn't answer the question. He says, I already told you what you're going to know. Just help the woman to be careful to walk in the manner that I instructed her. He doesn't know who he's talking to yet, clearly. Uh, Maybe Manoah thought he was an angel. Maybe he thought he was some sort of prophet. We don't know. Uh, But we do know that he asks, he says in 17 and 18, what is your name so that when the words come true, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name? Seeing it's wonderful. Now, this idea of wonderful, it can be his name, just like in Isaiah 9, 6, the wonderful counselor. It, It could possibly be his character, that he is wonderful. 
But here's how he knows who he's speaking to. It's when he gives the offering and the flames go up, this angel of the Lord rises in the flames. They fall to their faces and they say, we've seen God. We're not going to live. Now, his sensible wife talks him off the ledge with some common sense. But what we find here is it was not an angel of the Lord as in some sort of, it was Yahweh himself. God himself came to declare to them, you will have a son and this son will begin a salvation from the, peop- from the Philistines. You're going to give birth to a savior, is what he said. A savior of my people. It's incredible. Again, you, you, you hear these echoes of Christmas all over this passage. Well, of course, accordan- in accordance with the word of the Lord, this happens. Look with me at 24 and 25. He says, and the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. The young man grew. Notice the similarity in the language. And the Lord blessed him and the spirit of the Lord began to stir in him. You don't hear anything about his upbringing. You don't hear about how strong he was as a kid. You don't hear anything. Just like Jesus. Jesus, you don't hear anything about his upbringing. A very little bit. Here he grew. He was blessed of God. The spirit began to stir him. Now that, that, that word for stir means to agitate, to promote. That God's spirit is filling and moving him. In fact, Samson has the spirit come upon him more than any other biblical character in the Bible. It's unique. God saves sinners through a spirit-filled Savior. That's really what the chapter is about. God is moving to a people who have sinned and fallen away. And he's moved to a people in this spirit-filled Savior. Now, what do we take away from this? Uh, What should we learn? Uh, People want to think that this is teaching us on all kinds of different things. It's really teaching us about the character of God here. And what I want to do here, and with all the preaching, is I don't want to simply inform you that you understand now chapter 13 better. I, I want it to become like a feast for you. That you learn about the nature of God, that it leads you to worship him so that you'd never forget him. And you'd definitely not forsake him because he is wonderful. I I, I want it to not just inform, but transform so that you have material now in your mind and heart that it's easier for you to worship him and to enjoy him. And then out of the affections that you develop for this God who is revealing himself to a forsaken people, that that would motivate you towards holiness. That would motivate you to loving your wives well and loving your husbands well and, and honoring, speaking with integrity and honesty and living with, in a way that would honor God. That that's the fuel for you as opposed to duty or fear that if I don't, then this will happen to me. That doesn't last long. Promises of the world are too alluring that the threat of God and the threat of punishment doesn't save. It may it wake you up to some truths, but it cannot save you. But the beauty of God can. It's like, a, it's like moths to a light. I mean, we're just drawn to him when we know about him. So let me give you five things to consider about the nature of God that you see in this chapter. Number one, you see that God is a God of grace, clearly. I mean, God initiates salvation. You don't hear him repenting. You don't hear him crying out. You don't hear him complaining at all, frankly. They're doing fine in servitude to the Philistines. They're not looking for any help. They're not calling to God, but God moves anyway. I mean, God moves. They are deadened to God. God has to move. Dead people cannot move themselves. He he basically busts into their life. You know, C.S. Lewis says that God is the that God is the transcendental interferer. He interferes with us. I love that. He did with me. I was a CPA doing great, loving life, married, happy, everything's beautiful. He interfered in my life, frankly. He he stepped in where I wasn't asking for, and he moved things to the side, woke me up. He interfered. That's what he did. I didn't ask for him. I wasn't looking for him. He is the divine interferer. That's what he does. It's amazing how kind God is. Do you see the absolute necessity that grace moves God to save us? I mean, it's so, it's liberating when you get a hold of it. Because what it means is if he moves with grace to save, then he's going to walk you all the way faithfully to the end. 
that you don't have to fear that he's going to move with grace and then back away. You know, when I used to teach the kids how to ride their bikes, you know, you, you go with them, you put the training wheels on, you take those off, and you, then you, you push them along, but they, they start wobbling quickly, and you kind of run with them. But you, you know that time, that final time when they finally get it, the light turns on, and they get so excited, they keep going on their own. That's not the way salvation works. And God doesn't kind of help us and get us going along and say, okay, now I got you going. Keep going. You better keep going. If you don't keep pedaling, you're going to crash. If you don't keep living holy, you're going to crash. It's not the way it works. God just keeps along. His grace saves in the beginning. It saves in the middle. It saves to the end. And this is encouraging because when you trip and you fall and you sin and you dive back into sin again and you bring a ruin to your life, Maybe you get in an argument, you say things, you do things that just rupture relationships. But God still means to save you. He's calling you back through repentance and faith. J.I. Packer, a great theologian out of England, just died a few years back. He says, I need not torment myself with the fear that my faith may fail. As grace led me to faith in the first place, so grace will keep me believing to the end. Faith, both in its origin and in its continuance, is a gift of grace. Your salvation will be fully of him, not starting him and finishing with you. So we see that God is a God of grace. That's why he keeps going back to these people. Uh, but secondly, you see that God works and saves through really unique ways, surprising ways. So look at Manoah and his wife. You know, Manoah is a man from the tribe of Dan. The tribe of Dan, they were the lowest of the tribes. They were idolaters. They couldn't even push out. You know, when, when Joshua in chapter 19 gave them the land allotted to them, they didn't even drive out the people of the land. They just made peace with them. It was a know-nothing tribe. And, and she, as I said, she's nameless, she's childless, and she's barren. Now, to be barren in this culture was a huge problem. You were thought forsaken of God. Uh, to, be, to be childless, you were uh, in fear of the future. It was an agrarian society. Who was going to take care of you when you got older? So it was a mark of absolute hopelessness. And yet God goes to her lowest point, her weakest point of hopelessness, and he uses that to save her. And he uses that to save others. This is the incredible nature of God. What do you think makes you useful to God? Do you think, well, I've got to have an education, I've got to be gifted, I've got to be a good speaker, I've got to be a great teacher, I've got to know people, I have to have a super personality? What makes, he may use those things, no doubt, but what makes you useful to God is, frankly, I think your weakness, your inabilities. For those of you, some of you are older and you're kind of writing yourself out of God's script now because you think, I'm too old, I, I'm past it, I, I can't really be involved anymore in the lives of the saints, or maybe you're too young, you don't have enough education, but, but you kind of move yourselves out. But God loves to use the weak to accomplish his purposes. Loves to do it. You know, Hudson Taylor was the great missionary to China, probably the greatest known missionary to China. And he said this, he said, um, I often think that God must have been looking for someone small enough and weak enough for him to use, and then he found me. That's the way we are. God uses the weak. So we, again, in our meritocracy of the culture, we are valued upon what we produce and how good and great we become. But again, God saves through unique ways. Areas that you think you're the weakest, most vulnerable, maybe you feel the hopeless, maybe you feel the most forsaken. God uses those things. Why does he do it? to show us his glory, to show us his kindness, to show us that it's not of us. You, you see, so God doesn't just save by grace. He doesn't just save through unique means and measures. And by the way, we see the same trouble when Jesus came in his earthly ministry. People didn't get him either. God brings this son of a carpenter, and they weren't even sure if it was the son of the carpenter, frankly or not. They thought he was illegitimate. But here, God is using this unique way to bring about redemption of the world. They didn't see it. I hope we're not blind to it. I hope we learn from the lessons of the Old Testament. That's why Paul said they were written, that we'd learn and see. But then thirdly, you see that God saves through impossible means. God saves through impossible ways. So you have, you have Manoah's wife. I wish she had a name, but she's just known. But that, that's God's style. 
and she's barren, and he gives life to a dead womb. Now, that doesn't surprise you if you've read the Bible. You know Sarah, you know Rebecca, Hannah, the same thing, Elizabeth in the New Testament. But those even pale in comparison to God giving life to Mary's womb. She was a virgin. So it wasn't even barren. She hadn't even been with a man, and yet God brings forth life. Now, why does God save in such impossible ways? Why does he save in ways that we can add nothing to the final product? I think he does it to show us that salvation belongs to God alone. Only God saves. We, we, we may start a hundred self-salvation projects. I'm going to change my life. I'm going to have meaning and purpose in my life. I'm going to become actualized. I'm going to pursue this to be fulfilled. And we start all these self-salvation projects, and they all crumble. And, and if they don't crumble in your life, they'll crumble in your death. But salvation belongs to God alone. He's reminding us that our, that sense of power that we feel we need to have to feel safe, it's an illusion. Sickness can do that to you. It's an illusion. He's reminding us to set your eyes on God. Back to Psalm 123, I was looking at the psalm this morning. To you, I lift up, to you, I lift up my eyes. O oh, you who are enthroned in the heavens, behold, as the eyes of the servants look to the hand of the master, as the eyes of a maidservant to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God till he has mercy on us. That's what he's trying to get us to do, to see that he saves in impossible ways so that in all things we turn to him. And in fact, Francis Schaeffer was a theologian in the mid-20th centuries, and he said, he said, any Christian should have as part of their prayer list, they ought to be praying for something that is absolutely impossible. At least one thing you ought, you ought to have. You ought to be praying for something that is so radically out of our control or our manipulation or whatever. We ought to be praying for these things, reminding us, God, it, it's impossible that you have to do it. I think it's a good practice to have. Fourth, you see that God saves through faith. And you see in Manoah this questioning of God. He wants to know what manner of life will this child be? What should I do? Now, you can imagine if you're told that you're going to have a savior, you're going to have a judge, you're going to have a deliverer of Israel, you're going to have one. You're going to want to say, I want to get it right. I want to do the parenting thing right. And so what do I need to do? And he tells them nothing. God says nothing. He just says, my name is wonderful. Now, that, that Hebrew word for wonderful can mean beyond understanding. In other words, God doesn't tell him what to do. He tells him who he is. He gives him his character. Uh, he, this is who I am. I'm trustworthy. You know, it's amazing in, in life, particularly as you see kids grow up, parents are hoping if the child is maturing, that they don't need to keep telling them what to do. They're beginning to learn that. It, it, it's, you begin to know your parents, their love for you, and you begin to respond accordingly. That's what, that's what he's teaching us here, that we need to walk by faith. You know, we tend to face uncertainties in life, and, and we begin to want to manipulate or negotiate with God. Hey, I got this sickness. God, if I do this, will you heal me? And, and we begin to negotiate or even manipulate God as if we're across a bartering table from God. And that's what Manoah is looking for. Give me the details of life. That's, we see that in pagan religions all the time. They go to the fortune teller. They go to the palm reader. They go to the soothsayer. Tell me what's going on. I need to know what's in the future. Because if I know the details in the future, that I can circumvent problems. I can live my life better. And God's saying, no, you won't know the future. I am the future. And I'm wonderful. I'm beautiful. And I'm kind. And I love you. And I've pursued you. You know where I stand. You can trust me. In this world over which I am ultimately and completely sovereign, even over sickness and death itself, you can trust me. I'm wonderful. Have you thought about God that way? Have you thought about him as wonderful, as beautiful, as happy? So he's saying, you can trust me. You don't have to run to the manipulating tactics of the pagans that we're called to have faith in God in this life. Faith in his goodness, even in the midst of death itself, we have faith that he has sent one who has died but is alive forevermore. So we don't need to fear even death itself. 
And the last thing I would say, and this is going to lead us to communion, is that God, he saves by grace. Uh, God saves through surprising ways. You know, God saves through impossible means. He saves through faith. But he also saves completely. And notice with me back in verse 5, it says that he will begin to save his people. It's interesting he says begin. Now, let me remind you, the book of Judges, 21 chapters, the first two chapters are introductions. There's two introductions in it. And then you have 3 to 16, which are the story of the judges, that is six major judges and six minor judges. And then you have 17 to 21, scholars would say that's an epilogue. It's like two conclusions. Now, there are no judges in 17 to 21. We'll look at that in a few weeks. But that's really, it's seen as a commentary. It's like a postscript. It's like a commentary on the people of Israel throughout the time. Chapter 13 through 16 is the end of the book. Samson's the last judge. After Samson comes the period of the kings. So Samson is beginning a work of salvation. That's what it says. Now we see, at least in the near future, that work is made complete in King David. What do we see David do? What was the high mark of his battle? Well, he fought Goliath. Who was Goliath? Well, he was, the, he was the big man of the Philistines. And to take Goliath out was to destroy the Philistines. And that's what David did. So he began that work. He's going to save. God said, I'll save my people from the Philistines. He began it. David completed it. But there's more going on, of course. Samson is not just pointing to David. He's pointing beyond to David, to one who will complete a salvation. You know, if you think of the parallels, I'm not going to give you all of them because it's probably a dozen and a half. But, you know, when you look at Samson and Jesus Christ, you can't help but note the parallels. Uh, they're both miraculous births. They're both divine announcements. Both mothers knew of their divine mission. Uh, both are filled with the Spirit. But you can keep going on. They both were forsaken of God. They both were betrayed by intimate friends. They both were sold for money. Uh, they both... They both died to save. You see these parallels. What he began, the difference with Samson and Jesus, is that what he began, Jesus Christ completed. And, you know, this is what leads us to the table. Is God has shown that he wants to save. You think about the, the types of Christ throughout the Bible. You have Abraham. He's a type of savior. He's given the promise that deliverance will come through his line. You see it in Isaac. He's the child of promise. You see it in Moses. He delivers the people out of Israel. You see it in Joshua. His name means salvation belongs to God. You see it in all the judges. You see it in Samson. You see it in David. David's a savior, a type of savior, though. All these were types of saviors. Uh, they brought about deliverances, but only to external circumstances. They never changed us. It was never permanent. That's why sin continues to repeat itself. All through the Old Testament, God's getting us hungrier and hungry. When will you bring one who's better, who can truly deliver and change us from the inside? Not just change the window dressing on the outside. That's the message of the whole Bible. And of course, it's met in the person of Christ. That Jesus completed, he accomplished by his life without sin, pleasing to the Father, by his suffering for our sins. All of our sins pushed upon him. He is a substitute for us. He, he took them upon himself and he bore the wrath of God. He bore the judgment of God. Sin has to be judged, you know that. We want any sin that has been done against us, we want retribution. We want some sort of reconciliation. And so God reconciles us to, his, to himself through faith in his son. This is the nature of the gospel. This is what we call you to believe upon. This is what saves. This is what changes us. It begins that work of change in us that he paid it all. There's nothing you can add to his finished work. Now, this ought not to create slothfulness or laziness. It ought to create worship, humility, gratitude. At a minimum, you know, after each judge, what did we find? The people found rest. A Savior came, they delivered, and they rested. That's what we're to be doing. We're resting. 
Resting is not laying on the couch on a Saturday morning watching television. Rest is that you have a shalom, a peace with God. You're rightly related to him. You're in good stead. He's forgiven you. He's given you a new name. He's given you identity. That's what communion is about. That Jesus has come to complete what we see Samson start, or at least continue. So let's take a moment now and just ask God for grace that he would help us uh, to enjoy <clears throat> not just the pattern of salvation that he has laid out for us across Scripture, but that he would bring about a full completion to the salvation through his own son. And, and when we take this moment, <clears throat> you know, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul does warn those of you who will take communion. And he says, you want to take it in a worthy manner. We want to be right with God. So he uses this as a time, perhaps to repent, to perhaps to give thanks, or perhaps even to turn to him by faith. And then I'll pray for us in just a moment. <clears throat> Hear this encouragement from the scriptures. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen.